about dance is that it is not only expressive, but it's, it can be explosive. It really is a revelation to, to figure out like, oh goodness, I, can, I have right and left and, and I, can, I can move them in, in coordination and I can move them in coordination with, with someone else. And not only just moving with someone else, but, but that like being in a close embrace or in a dance hold, which is pretty intimate, doesn't have to be sexual. And it also doesn't have to be this like high stakes, I'm gonna to totally blow it with this person as a friend or as a, anything else if I mess up. That, I think, is what, what is really changing for people. Social dancing is a great way to start to open up. Be yourself, watch the other, see what works, and my, some of my students find out for the first time in their life, you can come up with the only answer yourself. You've got a partner in a dance, work something out. Own it, it's yours, and there's more than one answer. There's more than one style, treasure it, value it, welcome chance intrusions into your expectations. Not allow it, grudgingly, welcome it, and then make something from it. Some say uh, waltzing is like falling in love for three minutes and then the waltz is over. But if you're with the right partner, you fall in love because there's this union, communion. I've had so many people come to me and say, oh, you know, I wanted to meet the special guy or the special woman. And um, instead they're like, oh no, I love dance. I just want to come dance now. Or, and they're, they're happy in the community and they don't, now they no longer want to be tied down. They, they just want to dance. Music is filling your body and you're in alignment with another person, moving with the music, in a room full of people moving with the music. It's magic. Little did I expect that learning movement for the first time in my life at 27 would feel like a revelation. And that's what it was about. Moving for the first time later in life, at 27, that's late in life, was an eye-opening for me. And it was a whole new world. It was exciting. Within a week, I was looking for more. Richard Powers teaches social dance at Stanford University. For three decades, he has taught and inspired dancers at workshops like this one in Seattle, Washington. Probably 95% of Americans don't dance. And not only because they've not had a chance, but some people are actually afraid of it. Some part of it is a, maybe a slight fear of being out in public. Maybe some of it is a slight fear of looking bad, looking silly, especially if you're not a student anymore. So I admire tremendously that 5% who actually go out to a dance class, and go out dancing, maybe it's 10%, but it's still the minority. This is the story of people who stepped up and onto the dance floor, overcoming their fears and discovering the joys of dance.
initially, I think it was a way to get some physical exercise and some socialization with my wife, something that we could do together. I uh, was looking for an exercise program that wasn't boring. A friend took me contra dancing, and that was my introduction, sort of my um, gateway dance. I got into dance classes because a girl that I was really interested asked me if I wanted to take swing dance classes with her. So I picked up a flyer in a bakery, it's called Honey Bear Bakery, and uh, to learn to swing dance. Well, I started taking dance lessons in 1993, soon after I got divorced. And I'd always wanted to partner dance, um, but I'd, I'd been dating someone who didn't want to, and so we broke up, and so I thought, I'm gonna learn to dance now. And I didn't care anything about swing dance. I didn't even know about leading and following. I just wanted to spend some time with this girl and hopefully get to date her. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out with the girl, but I loved the dancing. And um, I remember I was really nervous um, because I didn't know anyone. I got depressed after I got divorced and <clears throat> had to do something. And so I signed up. I, I saw a thing for, somehow heard about Living Traditions. Living Traditions was a dance business created by Walter and Nancy Anna Dill in 1990. They met at a Richard Powers workshop and fell in love. Living Traditions brought a playful, non-competitive style of partner dancing to the Pacific Northwest. I credit Walter and Anciana with so much of what's going on in Seattle now, that so much of the partner dance goes, goes back to them. Mary Lee Likes came out of them. Uh, the Century, Hallie began with them way back when. We were all taught originally by Walter and Anciana. The reason why Living Traditions work is that we focused on normal folks having fun, learning how to dance and connect versus compete and being judged on the bronze and silver and gold level. We just taught people to dance. Living Traditions closed shop in 2004 after Nancy and Adil was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. By then, the Dills had taught thousands to dance. They had created a vibrant dance community that continues today. My advice to any person is align yourself with somebody who's very strong, uh, be it if you're a guy, with a woman, whatever. Just align yourself with somebody who's powerful and willing to communicate, and you'll have a great time if it's a reciprocal relationship and encourage and allow your partner to screw up and yourself too, because it's fun. Now ladies, raise your right hand and pull past your right ear. Look left, look left, and there you are. Look left, yeah, you're the left. Yeah. And that when you allow yourself to screw up, you're gonna learn a lot faster. It's easier. It, I think, actually, I think that's why Living Traditions was successful, is that we encouraged, we allowed people to screw up and we encouraged it. So people had fun in versus like, oh, I'm not doing it right, what do I do? Oh, I did it wrong. Uh, which is part of our whole educational system is judgment, you know, grades. We don't grade, we just encourage people to have fun. My experience that often some of the people that were the least skilled in the beginning or most out of their body, often became the best dancers because they simply showed up. Every person who enters the room as a student, I really see their courage. Because I know how challenging that is to drive, you know, find the address, drive there, park, you don't know anyone. One, two, three, four, step across. To go in One, and be two, willing to do something you've never done before and a lot of people have stories that they aren't good dancers or that they don't have rhythm and there they are you know to face their fear and you know they're, they're just hoping that they're wrong and that you can you know help guide them
many people have said to me, I'm not a dancer, I don't know how I am. Two left feet, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I say, baloney. Now you have to be willing to let someone teach you. Backwards. <laughs> no, you did it, you did it. Oh, right. That's an inside turn. I love dance, I love movement, I love music. I really love rhythm. And for me, dance, and especially a dance class or a dance, is less about the music and dancing and more about that it's a medium where people are coming together and connecting, actually looking in each other's eyes, touching each other's hands. It's kind of an excuse to not be watching TV. I'm single, I work way too many hours. The chance to, to get out and, and hold, hold lovely people in my arms, to be in their space, to... The two of you are making something that's never happened before, it'll never happen again. It's you, your partner, and the music, and it just, on a good day, it just flows, and it's just, it's inspiring, it's just awesome. Can you give me another activity where both genders, all ages, people who don't even speak the same language or have even similar belief systems, can collaborate and touch in a social context? In the world of dance, we use the term lead and follow as a tradition. But personally, I don't think the word follow is the best choice, partially because of baggage from the 1930s and 40s, the dark ages where follow used to mean obey. But partially, I don't use the f word follow, or I don't like to use it, because it's not true. That's not what women do. The women's role, the traditional women's role in social dancing is to interpret whatever signal she thinks the lead is giving. And once I started learning this idea of being able to lead someone with nonverbal communication, and uh, I I was hooked. They say in communications that the send function, let's say in radio transmission, is a lot easier than the receive function because the receive function has to be ready for 10 times more. And that's her role. It's not easy. And the men who know that, the men who respect that, are the admired and even revered partners on the dance floor. He knows she made a valid interpretation. He's there for her, not you made a mistake and even think negatively that she might have made a mistake. So the dynamic is much more fun than those terms lead and follow. I'm always looking for the way to uh, fit a dance pattern uh, right into the, what the music means to me. And it's a good chance for partners to get to cooperate, hopefully, uh, in that, although maybe one is more interpreting the music than the other, but hopefully in a cooperative fashion. In social couple dancing, truly social, social couple dancing, Collaboration in the truest sense is necessary <laughs> and nurtured. It takes a very brave person to allow for someone else's truth. And that's what's necessary in true collaboration. Um, to open yourself to what other people have to offer and not just think of it as integrating it into what you're doing, but truly being open to what else is happening. We teach role reversal in Stanford social dance too. And all of a sudden, the men, when they're following, saying, wow, she really did have the better role. This is fun. I just get to dance now. And she realizes, this is fun to steer a little bit. Both are having a lot of fun. And both think, oh, the other had the best deal all along. Actually, it's seeing the other side of the story in roles, not genders. But still, you have this crossover of, of, of getting more out of life, actually. One of the revivals that's been happening in the last few years is a revival of interest in waltzing. And one of the reasons might be it follows a swing craze of the 1990s. And a lot of people went to swing, and after five or ten years, some of them felt, great, I did that, now something else. They tried the next, next craze, which was maybe Latin salsa, 
and they feel, oh, that's not quite me. I feel like a poser. They try waltzing. All right, this is different, but it feels like me. Now, I'm not, of course, casting any um, dismissive claims to swing or salsa, but I do see people come from swing into waltzing, but they find something else, not just something different. But they find a kinesthetic effect of holding a partner, sharing weight with them equally, spinning around the room with not a lot of figures, but sometimes one basic step, almost like a trance state. And uh, some th theoreticians think this is what's going on in late self-hypnosis or hypnosis by watching a moving object and motion is important you become more open to the experience you'll remember that experience more vividly you will also recall other experiences more vividly when you're in a late trance state we're not talking about anything manipulative nothing into a heavy trance but when you're in the middle of motion Waltzing, that's more motion than just watching a pendulum. You're in the middle of it. And that sustained motion, people find that after a waltz, life is more vivid, just a little bit more. You're more receptive. And when we think of the idea of not losing life, having more of it come in more vividly, waltzing does that. You also happen to remember the face that was in front of you a little bit more vividly. Now that might be dangerous. There have been many stories written in the last 200 years about that face you waltz with, that person you all of a sudden are more receptive to. You see them more clearly. So this uh, other state is quite powerful and, and magical, but real. The rhythmicity of waltz, three, four time, is a natural flow. Da 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 da. Listen to your heartbeat. Boom 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 boom. It also has the, uh, for me personally, the sense of being rocked. Particularly on nights when I feel crummy or down, or bummed, when I go dancing, it's it's just like being rocked. I believe we have three choices in life. It is fighting, you know, disconnecting, disengaging, or dancing. And it's how you hold your whole being. And so I believe that partner dance, because the, the prime relationship in this world is yin and yang. It can be male, female, it can be whatever combination you want, but yin and yang are, is the perfect symbol. It's constant moving, it's dancing, it's a waltz. So when we dance, we hold ourselves like half of a circle. And you're virtually always holding yourself in this position, open, and I believe that it's like your arms are an extension of your heart, so you're moving from your heart. It's impossible to dance and worry simultaneously. You can do it, but you aren't gonna dance well. Dance demands 100% focus. Five, six, a couple more. And dancing, here's this microcosm again, this almost like a controlled laboratory where you can try not taking your partner for granted, really seeing them, where you can try not pushing away because you think it's wrong, but maybe this is okay. My teacher said, hold your partner this way. Well, maybe there's a different way of holding your partner that also works. My teacher said, this is the correct step. Well, maybe that step can also work too. And yes, you would have pushed that step away as wrong, unless you had just opened up a little bit more. You learn so much more about life and you don't miss so much. At the end of your life, you think, all right, yeah, I got a lot of it because I didn't push it away. And I learned that dancing. Smooth turn. Guys, place your back to the outside wall. Two more. Hey, if you're in life and you got to make a choice for a hobby, you could collect stamps, maybe, uh, you know, that's kind of an isolation. Maybe you buy horses. It's pretty expensive. But dancing? Hey, you just need uh, a pair of shoes and some clean socks. As a matter of fact, you don't even need clean socks. I'm a family doctor and I do a lot of geriatrics and I find that dance is an ideal form of exercise to uh, advise for the older patients, in part because it helps with problems of isolation. It's a very social kind of exercise. It's intellectually stimulating. Uh, so it helps prevent uh, the memory problems that sometimes come on because you're exercising your mind a lot. There was a study done in Florida of teaching Argentine tango in nursing homes. And the people who learned Argentine tango actually had less Alzheimer's disease over the succeeding years than the ones who weren't learning that. So I quote that oftentimes to patients. I 
wish my cardiologist could see me now. <laughs> it is true that dance challenges us in memorization and in coordination and cross-body, what they're finding is really important in terms of pathways in the brain. And in terms of healing, they're also finding now how important it is that people laugh and that they have joy and how important it is that they aren't holding anxiety and stress and anger. It's very healing because you're there in the moment and what's not great about, you know, good music and a fun person to be with. I believe music is the closest thing you can feel to spirit. When you're inspired, when you're inspired, when music, when you're really dancing, when you're really grooving, that you're inspired. And when you're really moving through life inspired, the spirit is in you. Life functions fully. Side together, side together, side together. So now as you go side together, we're gonna go down, up, down, up, down, up, this the direction you're stepping, okay? Down, up. Down, up. Now, your upper body's gonna stop and your lower body's gonna keep going. Go down, let's do the drinking duck again. Women typically have a little easier time doing this than us boy creatures, okay? We're just not used to moving. Take your baseball bat and swing left-handed. Or golf. And so, all these different little styles of dancing give you little ways you can say, oh well, I can choose to move differently. I don't have to move the same way, okay? If, if I want to be a psychiatrist and make diagnoses of people, I watch how they dance, watch how their bodies move, how they respond to the partner. Oh yeah, gosh yes. And particularly dancing with people, you, you just know an awful lot about them because much of who we are is in our body. One thing that I find fascinating about social dancing is the draw, the allure of it is different for every person. I always tell people it's about the music first and pick the music that really, really speaks to them and that's the dance class to jump into. And because if you really, really, really love that music and that style, all the rest of it just comes in time. And as we know as experienced dancers, anything we learn in one dance always translates to any of the other dances once you get enough experience. Uh, my daughters have been my primary relationship in the past decade mostly. I've been Mr. Mom. And uh, I've encouraged them to be strong and independent. And so what I've got are strong, independent young women. A lot of people our age like the bump and grind and the club dancing and all that. Which is good um, too. Which can be fun. Hip hop, you know, that's fun. I do that too, but there's a different kind of connection with partner dancing. And uh, a lot of kids don't understand that partner dancing can be cool. They say, oh, that's not cool. That's for old people, blah, blah, blah. Which is not true at all. Dance, again, in my experience, is the partner dance is the only activity that allows all people, all ages, I've danced plenty of times with people I can't speak with, but we have this marvelous connection because of this. If we could get the world leaders to learn to dance and corporate leaders too, be open and dance with everyone, not just you know, a few chosen select, but little kids, their kids, 
the, their enemies, <laughs> partners, you know, realize the world would be a radically different place.